Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Van Cleef, and I had the privilege of getting to know Rhonda over the last couple years in my role as a teaching pastor at Blue Oaks Church. Uh, Dennis asked me if I would share with you a message of hope today, uh, and that's what Rhonda wanted me to share with you as well. Uh, five of the most remarkable words that anyone has ever written, I think, uh, come from the pen of the Apostle Paul. Uh, he's writing to the church at Rome, and he's talking about suffering. And he says, suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And then he says these five words, and hope does not disappoint. Um, what does he mean by that? We live in a world where hope disappoints all the time. Uh, people have hopes, big hopes, often very good hopes, uh, and they get shattered. Rhonda had hoped that she would be healed of cancer, and that hope completely disappointed all of us. Uh, some people decide after things like that, I'm just not going to hope anymore, uh, because it just hurts too much when that hope gets shattered. Well, you know what? In this world, hope disappoints all the time, and sooner or later, one of these days, the news is going to come to every one of us in this room, which one day came to Rhonda, and that is, your days are numbered. An optimist may not face this reality, but wise people do. Uh, one of the most profound books of the last century was written by a man named Ernest Becker. Uh, it's called The Denial of Death. Uh, Becker says in the thesis of this book that it's, uh, we arrange our lives, uh, we human beings, around ignoring or avoiding or uh, pressing the most irrefutable fact in the whole world, which is, I'm going to die. You're going to die. Becker says that the avoidance or the denial of death is the mainspring of human activity. Uh, we arrange our lives around trying to be real busy and distracted from this truth because it's too big for us. Uh, we're all going to die. We don't like to think about that, but it's true. Uh, this is the one certain truth about me. As surely as I stand before you today, the day will come when I will not be standing. Death will come my way, and it will come your way too. And for most of us, because we have the luxury or the fortune or maybe the misfortune of not knowing when that day will come, uh, we can spend large portions of our lives or our entire lives pretending that that day will never come. But it will. And it will defeat every hope anyone has for future days on this side of the grave. And so the question of ultimate significance is, is there hope beyond this life? And I'm here to, t to tell you today that the writers of Scripture say there is. Um, this is the Christian hope that has been kept alive in the Church of Jesus Christ for over 2,000 years now. And this is much deeper than mere human optimism. It's stronger than the hope or expectation that things will turn out okay tomorrow or the next day. The Apostle Paul says, this is the hope that will not disappoint. It's summarized by another hoper by the name of David as his ultimate hope. It's summarized at the end of the most famous psalm attributed to David, Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. Uh, and that beautiful psalm ends with these words. David says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Uh, most of you have heard those words before. They've probably been spoken at as many funeral services over the last several thousand years as any other word in the world. Uh, but what do they mean? When David says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, he's not saying bad things will never happen to me because bad things did happen to him. This statement doesn't mean bad things will not happen to me in this life. This statement means that though these bad things happen, no matter how bad they are, they're unable to separate me ultimately from God's love and God's care. That means he will be with me in this life no matter what happens in this life. Whatever phone call I get, and it may be an extremely difficult call, God will be there in the unlikeliest of places and the darkest of hours. God is my hope through all the days of my life, and he'll be with me even through death. Death itself will not be the end of me. It will, in fact, be the beginning of real life. It really will. And I would say this is Christian hope. This is the ultimate hope. 
This is what David and Paul counted on when every other hope disappointed them. This is the hope that nothing could defeat, not even death. This is the hope Rhonda clung to right up to the very end. And this alone is the hope that will not disappoint because every other hope will someday disappoint. Now I want to ask you another question. When David says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, what is he hoping for? What does that look like? This is a strange thing to me, that this hope is at the heart of the Christian faith, and our whole eternity rests on it. This is everything that we have to anticipate on the other side of the grave. But there are a lot of people, including people who say they take spirituality very seriously, and I would say maybe the majority in our society, who've never given serious, adult, sober thought to what lies on the other side of the grave. They've never examined this hope closely. Sometimes that's even true for people who've been in the church for a long time. And this wasn't always the case. I mean, for many generations, when parents would tuck their children in at night, they would say a little prayer. Many of you know this prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Good night, honey. I hope you don't die in your sleep. <laughs> There's actually a second verse to that prayer. Our days begin with trouble here, our life is but a span, and cruel death is always near, so frail a thing is man. Sweet dreams, kids. <laughs> See, people used to teach their kids that prayer because people wanted their children to know that death is real, but it's not the end. It's not the end. There's another way to think about death. You know, I believe to the core of my being that if I could ask Rhonda what she would want me to share with you today, she would say, tell them about where I am. Like, give them hope that we will be reunited one day. And tell them about what matters most in this life. Tell them about how they can have eternal life. Because life on this earth is just a blink of an eye compared to eternity. I had lunch with a friend some time ago who said something along these lines. He said, I know I'm supposed to want to go to heaven. I know I'm supposed to uh, believe in this hope and that, uh, you know, that, that life is going to be great there. But frankly, it sounds kind of boring. Uh, some people have this idea that heaven will be like this ultimate retirement village that, that <laughs> you can have all the adventure and risk and work and so on in this life, but then after you die, you go to like an eternal weekend in Palm Springs. Uh, I've had someone ask me in all seriousness, will there be golf in heaven? Uh, his reasoning was, I can't be happy unless I'm golfing, and heaven has to be a place where I'm happy, and so there must be golf in heaven, right? And I had to explain, him that, explain to him that theologically it's true that heaven is presented as a place of ultimate joy, but maybe your mind uh, will need to be transformed so that you rejoice in what it is that heaven offers. Um, like, do you believe that God made you and saved you for nothing more than a significant, nothing more significant than an eternal round of golf? Um, besides, we know there will be no lying, swearing, or cheating in heaven, so how can golf do that? <laughs> now, when, when biblical writers speak about heaven, they're talking about a spiritual reality that's very difficult to convey to human beings who have not experienced it. And so they use images and pictures to express what is far beyond our experience. And it's like if you had to describe to someone who lived a thousand years ago what a car is or a rocket, uh, like how could you do that? You'd have to use images that they're familiar with in their context. And this is what the writers of Scripture uh, do for us. Uh, a lot of people get kind of a cartoon picture of heaven involving like halos and harps and things like that because we don't understand the reality, the spiritual reality that these images are intended to convey. And that's a real important thing because when that happens to them, they find themselves not really hoping for the ultimate hope of the Christian faith because they've never really thought about it in a grown-up way. They just have this kind of cartoon picture of it. And so in the moments that remain, I want to walk through a couple of these images that the writers of Scripture use to describe our ultimate hope. Uh, and I want to just get some clarity on this. And then at the end of the message, I just want to share with you about how this hope can be your hope. Uh, this is very important. Uh, one of the images the writers of Scripture use is singing. Uh, the writers of Scripture talk about how singing is going on in the afterlife. Uh, if you can just picture it right now, Rhonda is singing. I was thinking of uh, her favorite hymn, and how we were all singing this, and I was thinking, man, she's probably singing it along with us right now. Um, 
Some of you may not be sure how you feel about this. Uh, some of you are concerned because you don't have really that great of a voice, and so you start singing and it might be heaven for you, but it's hell for the person sitting next to you. <laughs> The reason the writers of Scripture talk about singing in describing the afterlife is that throughout history, when human, uh, the human heart is too full for words, uh, people sing. I mean, that's why we sing at a service like this, because we love Rhonda so deeply, um, and we desperately need hope. You know, little kids, they just learn to sing when they're happy. Uh, singing has a way of expressing wonder and awe and beauty and joy and love and admiration in a way that like, nothing else can. And this has been true throughout human history. And so the writers of Scripture speak about heaven as a place of singing because the day is coming for all of us, Rhonda is there now, when your heart will finally be as full as it can possibly be because you will experience God's glory. And I just want you to try to get your arms and mind around this. Like, imagine standing before God. You, like, born with your perceived understanding of this world, you know, in your job, your life, your personality, your experience, uh, standing before God. You know, our lives are marked by certain moments. You know, people will travel all the way to uh, Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon, and they'll just stand before it in a period of, Silence, just in awe or wonder. Uh, people will witness the birth of a child or the face of someone they love and they'll retain that memory for a lifetime. Try to imagine just for a moment yourself standing face to face with God, the God of the universe, the God who made you, the God who sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins. And with all barriers removed between you and Him, just unrestrained love and delight in His heart for you and in your heart for Him. Well, that day is coming for you, just as it has come for Rabba. There's another image the writers of Scripture talk about a lot, and that is a house. Uh, Jesus said in some of his famous words, In my house, in my Father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And the point of this is not that you're going to get the dream house that you've always wanted. Uh, it's that you're going to be home. And one day, we'll be home. Did you ever run away from home when you were a kid? My parents did something to deeply, deeply wound me. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but um, it'll come out someday in therapy, I'm sure. Uh, but I called my uncle and I said, you know, I've got to get out of here. And so I packed up my stuff. I sat down at the curb. I waited for my uncle to come and pick me up. And I waited for a long time and he never came. Uh, my mom finally came out uh, and told me that my uncle wasn't coming. Uh, she said, he's not coming because this is just a little temper of yours, and it's going to blow over. Uh, she said, he's not coming because he'll never be your mom and dad. He's your uncle. He's not your mom and dad. Uh, she said, he's not coming because you're 19 years old, and it's too old to run away from home. <laughs> <laughs> the writers of Scripture say, in a real deep sense, we're all runaways. We all are. We've all uh, defied or rebelled against God. And the day is coming for God's children when we will come home. There's a hunger inside everyone in this room to be fully accepted, to be fully uh, belong, to belong somewhere fully, to be deeply at peace, to have uh, a secure identity. And we talk a lot these days about having a safe place to know that you are loved and prized and cherished. You know, that's home. Home is one of the most pro provocative, uh, powerful and evocative words in the English language. Uh, and the truth is, in this world, we are not fully home. Uh, but that day is coming. I'd say some of the greatest words ever written come from Scripture in the final vision of John in Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and He will dwell with them. They will be with His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. I mean, think about God personally wiping every tear from every eye of everyone who has ever suffered loss. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. One day, one day we will be home. And our hearts will be filled with inexpressible joy. And God himself will dwell in our midst with inexhaustible love. 
This is the Christian hope. And my question for you today is, is this your hope? I know it's the question Rhonda would have for you today. Is it your hope? I mentioned a few moments ago the statement by David from Psalm 23. I think maybe the most remarkable part of that statement is David's first word. He says, surely. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, certainly, for sure, it's a done deal. This is my ultimate hope. Whatever else happens, whatever other disappointments I have in this life, I can count on this one thing. It doesn't mean you never have doubts or fears. It means God's plan for his people is that they be an authentic relationship with him. He wants to assure his children about the future. And I want to explain how it is that ordinary human beings are able to say something like that. Um, you were designed by God with the capacity to live with him, to be with him. You were created in his very image, and that's a remarkable thing. Uh, there is a wonder about you. There is a wonder about you and the person sitting next to you right now. I got to witness my daughter really enter this world, and when I saw that, there was this, this sense of wonder because she was filled with value and goodness and beauty and mystery. And I, I saw that when she was born. And then the months go by, and I find she's filled with other things too, stubbornness and selfishness and the capacity to deceive and defy her father. Where did she get that from? She got it from her mother, that's where she got it from. <laughs> See, the truth, of course, is that all of us have this brokenness. We all do. There's a wonder about you and me, but there's also a brokenness about you and me. The Bible says all have sinned. And that's true about you and me. And you and I better confront this. Uh, the most powerful optimist, the most hopeful optimist better confront this at some point. There is a darkness inside of me. I can deceive, I can be cruel, I can become very self-preoccupied, I can be selfish, I can be proud. You know, optimists may not, may not uh, may deny this, but I mean, read the paper. Look at your heart, look at my heart. I read a letter that a little boy wrote to Santa Claus. He said, Dear Santa, there are three boys living in my house. Jeffrey is two, David is four, and Michael is seven. Jeffrey is good some of the time, David is good some of the time, Michael is good all the time. I am Michael. <laughs> you see, the problem is that none of us is Michael. Uh, not one of us is perfect. If we were able to show a video on the screens of everything that you've ever thought or said or done in the last month, most of us would be embarrassed. I mean, we live with a sense of regret because none of us is perfect. The writers of scriptures say that this is very serious. The Apostle Paul says to the Church of Rome, for the wages of sin is death. The wages, the natural consequence of sin is death. And so that sets up this enormous problem. How do we get right with God when there's this chasm, when there's this moral gap between me and him? A perfectly holy God and a fallen, sinful person. Now this is the point where many people suffer for quite, suffer for quite a vague hope. Oh, people think, that if I just do enough good deeds, if I pray enough prayers, if I give enough money, if I go to church often enough, if I volunteer for enough charities, maybe somehow I can pay the debt. The writers of scripture say, there is no enough. There is not enough I can do. There is not enough money to be given. There is not enough deeds to be performed on my own. If I were on my own with this moral debt that I owe to God, I would have no hope. I would have to face death with no hope. It would be time to find another hope. And God has given us another hope. The writers of Scripture teach that when Jesus died on the cross, though his enemies thought that it was the end, he was really dying the death that you and I, by our rights, should have died. He was paying the price that you and I could not pay for our sins. The penalty fell on him. And so as a result of that, God says, the price has been paid, your debt has been paid, I offer you forgiveness now as a free gift of grace. That's how people are separate with God. But you have to decide. You know, for this hope to be certainly and surely yours, it's not enough to understand it. You actually have to make a decision. You have to say, all right, God, I acknowledge I'm a sinner, and I understand there's not enough I can do to pay that debt, and I understand that Jesus Christ came from heaven to this earth to die on a cross in my place to pay for my sin that I couldn't pay. 
And so I receive forgiveness as a free gift. And I ask Jesus Christ to be the forgiver of my life and also to be my leader, to be my guide. And I'll live in submission to him all the days of my life, in his goodness, in his mercy, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And when you make that decision, when you live that life, you can say, surely, certainly, this is my hope. It's the most important decision a person can make. That was the most important decision Rhonda made of life. And you know, I believe if Rhonda were here and she could give you one gift today, she would give you the gift of knowing that your sins are covered by the blood of Christ so that you know you're going to be in heaven with her one day. I mean, that's the gift that she would give because that's the only gift that would guarantee that she'll see you in one day. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ with your life, what better, to, what better way to celebrate today? I mean, this is a celebration of life service. And I can't think of a better way to celebrate than to say to God, I want to trust you as a way to be in heaven one day. And I just want to give you a chance to do that right now. So I'd like to ask everyone in this room if you would just join me in prayer. And if you want to bow your heads and close your eyes, if that would be helpful for you to focus, you can do that. Some of you are here, and this is the first time you're hearing this, and so maybe you need to consider this. Maybe you're not ready to make this kind of a decision yet, but maybe you need to attend a church, maybe like this one, Valley Community, or Rhonda's Church in Hayward, or the church where I teach on the weekends. You know, get connected in a church where you can continue to explore Christianity. Ask God to help show you the way. But for those of you who are ready, I just want to challenge you right now. If you understand this hope that we're talking about, but you've never really taken this step, you've never made this decision, will you just face the truth? Which is you need to make a decision so that you can have this sure and certain hope right now. And I want to invite you to pray in your spirit as I pray out loud. God, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to tell us the good news that you love us and that you want to welcome us into your eternal home one day, the same way that we believe that you did for Rhonda when she came home. God, we believe you are who you say you are. We believe that you came to give us life in all its fullness. God, we believe there's nothing we can do to free us from our sin or the consequences of our sin, that you paid the price, Jesus, through your death on the cross to set us free from sin. And God, for the rest of our lives, for whatever time remains between now and when we die, we, just, we give our lives to you. We give you our hearts and our minds and our jobs and our possessions and our families. We don't want anything back. God, we trust there will come a day when, we re when you remove every suffering, when you make every uh, injustice right, when you multiply every joy. God, we look forward to that. We look forward to the promise of that. We look forward to being reunited with Rhonda one day and with others that we love so much. And we look forward to seeing you face to face one day. We look forward to this because of the hope that we have through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's his, in his name that we pray. Amen. Now you just need to know that if you prayed that prayer and you meant it, that you've entered into this life. You've made the most significant decision that a human being can make in this life by far. And I know Rhonda would be so delighted to know that someone came to know Christ through her death. Um, and you'll be able to tell her that one day when you see her.